ever dreamed of exploring another world? Could you witness something new? Push boundaries? Or reach for your greatest hope? The experience of every generation is yours. On the History Channel, where the past comes alive. What you're about to see is a chapter of World War II that is relatively unknown. We must remember that World War II was truly a world war, with combat stretching into the most remote and forbidding corners of the globe. You're about to hear stories from what some think of as the Forgotten War, the conflict in the China-Burma-India theater, or the CBI, a region with resources that Japan needed to wage war. Japan's advance had to be stopped, and that meant severing the Japanese supply lines, in particular the bridges. Charged with cutting those supply lines, the U.S. Army Air Corps, 490th, otherwise known as the Skull and Wing Squadron. Like all American forces, the 490th faced many challenges. Nothing was easy. And because so much time and money had to be focused on Europe and the Pacific, those in the CBI theater found themselves last in line for everything. Weapons, ammunition, supplies, even food. As a fellow flyer, I'd like to think I have a special understanding of what, what the 490th faced, what its men achieved, and how important it was for all of us. There's a spirit of camaraderie that you feel. And we were so close because we were stuck out in the middle of nowhere. The respect that we have for each other, that's the biggest thing. I haven't met a person who isn't proud of the outfit. It's like, hey, we've survived this far. We're part of the tradition. And we are. We're part of a tradition. Well, first of all, I had no idea where Pearl Harbor was. In those days, uh, you know, there was no TV or anything. I kind of figured it was in Manila in the Philippines. But anyway, when uh, we got home, we told my mother, and I said, well, I'm going to go down and try to enlist. I went to the recruiting office, and the lines extended clear out into the street, down the sidewalk of young men waiting to enlist. There was a high degree of patriotism, and those who didn't enlist were drafted. So if you enlisted, you had more control over what your future held for you. Being Jewish and having parents who came from Russia, we got a number of letters from our family that were in trouble, and then the letters would disappear and stop, so we knew something was happening to them. So I had a lot of motivation. So I went down to the Navy office, and I took a test on the colorblindness, and I failed it. So at that time, the Navy wouldn't take you. 
So I went to the Army Air Corps. Boy, they grabbed me real quick, and that's where I got started. I, I was a ham radio operator since I was age 15. And since I was a radio operator, I know Morse code. I can send, receive, you know, pretty fast, something like 25 words a minute. And so uh, I figured I, I can be useful. I had always wanted to fly, and they had opened up uh, the cadet training to uh, people without college education. The first time I went, I was a little reluctant <laughs> and turned around and came home. Uh, however, the, the second time I went ahead and took the tests and qualified for the cadet program. It wasn't so much the fact that I wanted to fly an airplane. I looked forward to the glamorous life that an Air Corps pilot led in a country club. That was the life I wanted, and uh, it looked super good. Join the country club at 21 and live the good life. And if you had to fly airplanes, they'd do it OK. I'll tell you this, and this may sound funny to you now, but I had never been 60 miles from my home till I joined the service. We boarded uh, Santa Paula, uh, which was a banana boat that used to have room for 200 passengers and bananas in the hold. Well, they put the soldiers in the hold and the, and the officers in the cabins up above. As we marched, you know, marched up on deck and, and started to go down the hold, I saw some open cabins. So another fellow and myself moved into the cabin, locked the door. No matter who pounded on the door, we didn't open. When the ship set, set sail in the morning, we had a cabin. And I played hearts and pinochle for two or three days. I got so bored I couldn't stand myself. This would have been uh, right after the hurricane came up through. And we had a large convoy, but you'd never know it because of the waves. I could stand on the deck, could not see another ship around when we were in the swell. When we get up on top, I could see 98 ships. It took two months during May, June, July of 42, which was the worst sinkings of all Allied ships during World War II. And we zigged and zagged across the ocean we had a number of submarine scares where we all had to put on a life jacket and come up on deck. And finally, we made it to Karachi, India. I finally made it to Karachi, and the 490th was just in the very beginning stages of organization. We were out digging trenches out in the field, no airplane yet. And all of a sudden, one day, we looked up, and here come nine B-25 flying over. And that was the first of the squadron that we'd seen. And that's where we first become the 490th squadron, which we had no idea up to that time what it would be. We did a little bit of training in Karachi. By the time we left Karachi, we had 10 airplanes. I was the 10th pilot. I got the 10th airplane. The squadron moved all the way across India from the west coast, which is Karachi, to almost the east coast, to what is now Bangladesh, to a little town called Andal. As far as serving in India is concerned, I looked at it as two fronts. The Japanese was the number one front, but we also fought what I call the five M's. We had the monsoons, and then the mosquitoes, and then the malaria, and then there was the mold and mildew that got on our clothes and was damp all the time. And uh, then there were the monkeys. Now that was another war. The monkeys would come into our barracks and wreak havoc with our mosquito netting, just tear it all to pieces and urinate all over everything. When it wasn't raining, when there was no monsoons, temperature could go to 110, 112. 
our wrenches would, would literally be 130, 140 on the uh, airplane wings. It being so hot over there, you can't imagine. You, it, uh, you couldn't wear a shirt, or it'd be so hot. And yet, if you leaned against anything, you got burnt. And it was pretty miserable, actually, but we did it for a few years. <laughs> we weren't really uh, what you'd call seasoned troops of any kind. We were all civilians. Just came into the service for the war, so we were all trying to figure out what to do. First mission we ever went on, every single person was on his first mission. There were no veterans. So the first few missions were relatively easy. Drop your bombs and run for home. I think it's probably the second or third mission we had. We had a, our first casualty. He lost an engine taken off. And he tried to set it down, but he couldn't unload his bombs. He couldn't get rid of them, so he had to try to land with them. Well, that didn't work too good. It went down in a pond and they killed all, all the crew. We had to dig out our own buddies and bury them. We were initiated at that time. We were at war. At the Salt Lake City reunion, one of the events was a trip to the Air Museum. We even had one airplane dedicated to our squatter. And every time I go down there, I go and pat that sucker and see if it's still there. Yeah, you, know, you feel like you can just get in and fly it. They've done a good job restoring this. Oh, it's thing, beautiful. It? It's beautiful. This one's been modified. Though. I, I guess so. You look in the, in the Bombay, and it's different. It goes clear to the top. I put a good many bombs in one of them suckers. The mission of the 49th Bomb Squadron was to destroy bridges. Well, these bridges are 16, 20 feet wide. We were bombing at from 10 to 15,000 feet, mostly at 10,000 feet, with a Norden bomb site. And even though it's a good bomb site, it's very difficult to hit a 16 foot to 20 foot wide bridge from 10,000 feet. So 90% of our missions were failures. We, we surely dropped a lot of bombs that didn't do anything except make holes in the ground, no question about that. The squadron early on was using the techniques that they use in the South Pacific of skip bombing, that sort of thing, which was to come in at low altitude and drop the bomb, and, and the bomb would skip along the surface and maybe hit a ship. But the trouble with that type of bombing on bridges was that unless you hit one of the supports of the bridge, it would go underneath the bridge. It would bounce off the bridge and maybe go off 100 feet away and blow up in a rice paddy or something, and therefore not do any damage. They came up with a method that the squad accidentally discovered while going on practice skip bombing. We had a Major Erden, who was our commanding officer. He went out bombing one day, and as he was coming in low, there was a tree ahead. Well, they pulled up to miss the tree. And then he was getting to the bridge, so he put the nose down. They give it a little loop up, and then went down, opened the bomb bay doors, dropped his bomb. Several of the crews developed the technique to the point where it was almost perfection, as perfect as it could be. 
From then on, we had, I would say, 120, 130 bridges that we knocked out. That was where we acquired the name of Burma Bridge Busters. These airplanes, you know, they were pretty fast as a C and a D. They used to fly at about 230, it seemed to me, but after they put all the armament on and they moved the turret up forward, uh, it uh, slowed it down. But when you were making your bomb run, and these damn mountains came up on either side of you, 270 miles an hour, it seemed like you were going 1,500 miles. Those damn trees went by pretty fast. Those guns up there were miserable, even though they were turret, because your guns were down here, your handles were about here, and your sight was up here. But you know, it's about everybody that had anything to do with B-25 were hearing aids. They were the noisiest side of the yeah. What position were you? What did you? Loading bombs, loading ammunition, this type of thing. Pretty good old airplane. The airplanes that the 49th had from inception up at uh, Karachi in 1942 was B-25s. It was a two-engine medium bomber and a wonderful, wonderful instrument. It uh, takes an awful beating from shrapnel and whatever's thrown at it. When I first came there, they had B-25Cs, which had plexiglass noses, bombardier sat up there, a navigator right near him, pilot, co-pilot, engineer, gunner, radio gunner, and sometimes a, t a tail gunner. It was very, very close quarters. And when I think back today about the things that the navigator had to go through, I just can't imagine how he did any of his navigator because he had such a small area to work in. You know, they had big charts and they were trying to look out of the window in their theater sextants or whatever. In the top tour, the controls were down here. And I had to pull it back, I lift the guns up, I lower the gun, turn it to the right, turn it to the left. And my sights are right between the guns and the guns is on each side of me. And of course, there's a plastic dome over me. And that's where I sat. It was one of them with a solid nose that had cannon in it. And poor navigator, he had to load that time thing and get out of the way when the pilot <laughs> fired it because it would have had quite a recoil. People would swear the airplane stopped uh, in mid-flight. The only time that I flew was on test hop. If we had an engine change or some major uh, problem, after an engine change, someone in the crew always had to fly, just to prove to the pilot that we did a good job. And I loved that. I would fly every time we fixed an engine and, and sent a plane up. It was just fun. I knew that we'd done a good job on the engine. I knew we had a good crew. I had no doubts. They fly low over the chin hills, and, and if we had the glass snows, especially, go up and lay in that and just skim over the hills. It had a, it had a grace to it. It just had a grace to it. The ground crew was extremely important to us. The maintenance crews, the refuelers, the bomb loaders, everyone had the same esprit de corps that the air crews did. i tell you one thing, a loading bomb made you awful fast. Because when you dropped one, even though you know it wasn't going to go off, you ran. And <laughs> well, we had Indian troops, and they, they were our airplane guards and we were cranking up 1,000-pound bombs. Well, one of these come down. Some way or another, the cable broke. Well, we took off, as usual, and this Indian guard standing out there, 
We ran right by him. And that poor guy, he didn't know what he was running from, but he passed us all, rifle, <laughs> big heavy boots and all. But he, it took a while for him to come back after we got back and then started loading again. As a communications guy, we were responsible for setting up telephone lines. We were responsible for fixing radios and sending and receiving messages so that everybody was in communication. We had a little three kilowatt generator, a little small one, one longer gasoline engine, which supplied power for our shack. And it was just limping along. And we knew that the piston rings were going. I wrote a letter to DW Onan and company and said, can you send me some rings? And about a month later, came 100 rings. I mean, I didn't need 100 rings. But you know, that was the interesting thing. I, if I couldn't get through supply, I wrote directly to the factory. So we went around, around the supply. We went around every path we could to do the job. The, the guys became experts in finding ways to fix things. They became experts in, in repairing engines. We swapped parts here and there. It was part of what you might call an American ingenuity and in, in spirit of not always sticking by the book, but sticking enough by the book that you don't screw it up, but being entrepreneurial and getting things working. I made it a point that when the airplanes took off in the morning on a mission, I was there. When it came back, I was there. So I could talk to the pilots if there was problems. And uh, excuse me, if something didn't come back, it hurt like hell. It was a long wait, because one thing about if they weren't back in about five and a half, six hours, they weren't coming back, because that was the range of a B-25. There was a number of things happened that uh, they couldn't come back. Some of it was weather. All of our bombing was low level from 500 feet even down to 250. And uh, on those kind of missions, the bombs had a, a time fuse in it so that airplane could leave the area. And more than once, they went off on contact and just blew the airplane out of the air. The worst feeling is in the barrack when you try to go to sleep. You lay there and just wonder, where are they? Are they dead or alive, you know? I uh, played cards with a navigator quite often. And uh, he went down one day and didn't come back. And his roommate brought his uh, A2 jacket over to me and uh, gave it to me. I kept that for a long time, but every time I looked at it, I, I knew Sid was gone, you know. And, I think that uh, the war uh, really didn't begin seriously for me, uh, perhaps until the time when I had somebody shooting at me. It was in the clouds, and when we come out of a cloud, and this fighter plane come right out, was a white, white colored on it, a jet plane. I think he was probably 200 feet away from us. All my traces started going through these cockpits as soon as he didn't even know he was getting hit. I had no feeling of fear or anything, but outwardly, but inwardly, I must have and didn't realize it. And I do know that every time that we had enemy airplanes that were attacking us, your mouth would be so dry that, uh, and yet you have no feeling. While it was happening, you wouldn't even be thinking about it. As far as the missions being memorable, uh, mission number 30 was uh, one that I had flown every day of my life since then. I was a navigator. I was riding the co-pilot seat. When this we came around on our bombing run, one engine went out on us. So we just barely scraped over the treetops, and all the altitude we could get 
was about 3,100 feet, and we had flown over these 7,500-foot mountains getting over there. So Vernon Marsh, the pilot, turned to me and said, well, how do we get home? They couldn't maintain altitude, so the guys had to jettison everything that they owned to keep that thing in the air. The engineer came back and said, I want all you fellas to sit still, nobody move. I said, I want you to reach over alongside of you and unbuckle the, the uh, cargo and slide it back, which we did. And you in the back, you pull the pins on the door. Don't go near that door. Once you pull those pins, you get away from it. You lay on your back and kick this cargo out. So I told Vernon, I said, I remember a pass they ran off to the northwest from the elevation of the road over to a valley on the other side of the hills. But uh, I don't know if it was open all the way over to this other valley. And it was too narrow for us to turn if we went up there and ran into a dead end and couldn't get through. And he came back four or five minutes later and said, we haven't gained any altitude at all. So he said, we're flying just above stall speed. Pass your helmets, rifles to the man behind you, which we did. So we decided we would fire our guns in bursts to get rid of the ammunition to lighten the weight of the airplane. Well, every time we'd fire the guns, our airspeed would drop down to close to 100 miles an hour, which was off of close to stalling speed. So we would have to back off and pick up a little speed and then fire our guns again to try to lighten the weight. Then he came back in four or five minutes, he said, well, he said, that didn't do it. He said, pass your billfolds, your chains, your fountain pens, your pencils to the man behind you. So we did that. And then he came back again and he said, we finally gained enough speed. He said, we're up to about 106. So we landed in this clearing in the jungle, Thanksgiving day in 1944. I tell people I had a little talk with the Lord that day, and I said, Lord, if you help me get back to Kentucky, I'll be smart enough not to ever leave that place anymore. One of the reasons that we stick together over this period of time, I think, is the death-defying moments that we experience together. And we're lucky to be where we are now. I don't know of anyone that had any compunctions about doing everything they possibly could to inflict damage and death upon the enemy. Even so, I did realize too that a lot of those Japanese soldiers were just the same as us. They were had families back home. They probably didn't want to be in the war any more than I did. Basically, we were bombing bridges. We weren't bombing and doing anti-personnel work to any large extent. It was so impersonal that you didn't get the feeling that you were killing people, although later the reports would say maybe so many Japanese soldiers were uh, killed. I think Japan and the United States now are allies. I think that, I think our scars are healed, that we don't look upon them anymore as uh, enemies. Uh, especially as we get older, you know, it, it fades. The hatred and animosity fades. I think all our, our, our overhead wires were bare, weren't they? Yeah, well, that was put up by the British. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I remember there was a, a monkey that was in that. One of the yeah. fellows had a pet monkey. That's how we got the monkey. Oh, well, he that, went up there. Yeah, well, he got caught a shock, fell yeah. down. And my roommate yeah. went out there to give him artificial Yes, yeah, that's right. Now, he was killed, wasn't he? No, what happened was we took the monkey out in the Jeep, went way the heck out, and turned him loose. At first, he followed us back. Then he climbed up a tree, and they had the saddest look on his face. <laughs> I think Sam Bucky had a sad look on his face. Yeah. Working at Kermitola on a plane and a jeep pulled up, 
Red Cross girl, and she hollers, soldier's coffee. I don't drink coffee, but you know, she was a pretty girl. So she says, sugar, and I said, I'll take sugar. She was around behind in the Jeep and got a dip of sugar out of the big kettle, and she turned around, and she hit her elbow and spilled the sugar all down the front. And she looked up with a cute smile, and she said, that's just like sugar on the donut, isn't it? Oh, man, that's not fair. <laughs> During the period that we were at Kermatola, the commander got a message from 10th Air Force headquarters that a ship had arrived in Calcutta with a load of stateside beer. So they took two B-25s and we went in there and made wooden racks and hooked them into the bomb bay. One of the old pilots asked me if I'd go down with him and I said, sure. Everybody's mouth was just drooling when they when they knew we were going after the beer. And when you have a successful mission, if uh, the CEO don't mind, you buzz the runway and do this. The pilot said, should we let him know we're here? And I said, we better. So he made this mission successful. Then he pulled up, and the damn shackles gave away. All the cases of beer were salvoed over the barracks area. And that stuff went right over our head and hit in the jungle right behind her. Well, we had this Captain Manuel. When he come around, he said, if the beers aren't open, you can't drink them. Somebody hauled her back. Well, sir, we're opening them so we can drink them. From then on, at all these reunions, there are a couple of guys that, that come up to me and said, well, how's the mad beer bomber of Kermitola doing? And I hate to be called the mad beer bomber of Kermitola, but, but that's what happened. We got up into China, and then for about three weeks, we couldn't fly because we didn't have gas. And finally we got our gas, but then we couldn't fly because we didn't have bombs. So after about a week or 10 days, we got our bombs. The um, planes were out warming up that morning, and they called and they said the war was over. Talk about a happy. <laughs> we flew down to Calcutta, and we stayed there till a boat was available to take us home. They sent us down to India, put us on a ship, and sent us home, and that's all there was to it. And that took 30 days. No zigging, no zagging, just zoom, straight home. And we were getting back in range of radios from the United States so we could start hearing the uh, big bands playing. We felt like we were going home then, you know, when we started hearing those big bands. So I came home. I didn't tell my parents because I had no chance to tell them. I walked in on them, and they, you never saw uh, happy and his tears and everything. When I walked down the street, I landed in Cincinnati. That was the strangest feeling that after two and a half years to come back to your hometown. It's, you know, in the uniform, still in the Army, but home. We landed in Tacoma, Washington on Christmas Eve, and the powers to be decided that anyone that lived within 50 miles of Tacoma could go home for Christmas. Well, I lived in Walla Walla, which is 290 miles away, but no one knew where in the hell Walla Walla was. So I went home. Getting home is a sort of a letdown for me. I, um, there, there's no excitement left. I, I like the excitement of fixing those planes and sending them out every day. And so getting home was just getting home. My sister picked me up at Fort Lewis and drove me up the house. Well, the folks were living in Seattle at the time, and my dad was an old German, bullheaded and stubborn. He wouldn't show any emotion if it killed him. Well, my sister, we pulled up there in the house, set up on a, oh, it must have been 25, 30 steps up to it, and he was sitting on the porch. And you know, you see these movies, you know, where the kid comes home from overseas, and glad to see his son and all that. My dad looked down, he turned and looked at the house, and, Hey, Ma, lock the icebox. She's home again. <laughs> that was my greeting. <laughs> A 
as we get older, we try to remember all of the good times that we possibly can, or the times in our life that we had to be proud of ourselves. We were so close, but I can also remember when my time to go home and the attitude, well, if I never see you guys, it'll be too soon, you know, again, you know, but it, it wasn't true. See you later. It took about 30 years for our first reunion. I sat down after the first one. I'd never miss another one, and I was going to try my damnness to be the last man. There you go. Thank you. Al Matthill, the gunner, every year that we meet, he brings me half a gallon of maple syrup from New York. And I told him, you don't need to do this. He said, you, you carried me through the most important period of my life. Excuse me. And I'll never forget it. Well, it's now 83. Chet Rodowski is 82. I'm 80. And, uh, well, <clears throat> we don't have too much time left. We talk about our families, and we talk about the war, and we refresh our memories with one another. I guess that's it. And we win the war every time we're there, too. Oh, yeah. We, we make sure it stays won. <laughs> <laughs> it's one place where we can talk about experiences and, and not feel like we're bragging or anything like that. And, of course, some of the stories, I think, as the years go on, get embellished a little bit. <laughs> the nice part about it is that we're getting a second generation involved in the people that are our host here in Salt Lake City. Their father was in the unit with us. The children of these people, especially those who were lost uh, during the war, will come to the reunions to learn a little bit about what happened to their dad or a little bit about them. I'm very pleased that my sons have taken an interest in coming because uh, it sort of shows that, that they've got an interest of what their dad did overseas. You can see in his face, in, in the way he acts, even the way he walks, he acts younger, he acts more vibrant. Uh, his voice is stronger. It's really interesting. And I've seen that with the other guys, too. Probably one of the most moving sessions of these get-togethers is when we have a little memorial that we go through recognizing those people who have been lost in the past year. William C. McIntyre. 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 John Thompson. Thompson, Thompson, Arlen Moore, 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 John Ligovet, 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 Vernon Cook, 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 Frederick Dunn, Dunn. Done. Bruce Frank. 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 Bruce Kirkpatrick. 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 Riley Papino. 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 Norman Schweinbrot. Schweinbrotten, Schweinbrotten, James Hodson, 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 Walter Johnson, 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 David Volk, 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 and Jean. Um, um, um.
In vain we call. They have passed through the valley into eternal sunshine. The places that have known them shall know them no more. We will write their faults upon the sand, the virtues upon the tablets of love and memory. This concludes our memorial service. And God love you. You know, I do wish everybody could witness this. You know, maybe not the 490th, but, but some sense of World War II. Um, Through the eyes of these guys. Exactly. A, as we have. Exactly. And I think that's the key. It's, uh, it's not a matter of reading it or, or sometimes seeing it, but you've got to see it through their eyes. And if you can do that, then I think you can gain a real perspective of America, of, of uh, history, of, of love of country, of, of dedication, camaraderie, a whole bunch of things that we all think we want. We just, I think a lot of times we don't know what that means. Looking back over 50 some odd years, I don't know of any other unit in the armed forces that I would have rather to have served with than with the 490. You know, it's not an experience that you necessarily would like to repeat, but it is one that you feel you went out, you did your duty, and you don't have to apologize to anyone. It was a tremendous experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Historians have recorded how successful the 490th was. The accidental discovery of the skip bombing technique made it possible for the squadron to destroy an astounding 192 bridges, denying Japan the ability to resupply its forces in Burma and China. And the 490th spread its wings in other ways as well. The squadron carried out regular food and ammunition drops to support Allied troops on the ground. But no fact and no statistic can truly tell the story of the skull and wings. Only these veteran warriors can, and we've been privileged to hear some of their tales firsthand. Clearly, there's much emotion there, but there's also that certain stoicism of men who tried only to do their duty. The men we've just met risked everything for this country and never asked much in return just the chance to share their experiences. As one flyer to another, I'm honored to be part of preserving their legacy. And I hope you'll be inspired to learn more about the so-called forgotten war in the CBI theater. The National D-Day Museum in New Orleans is dedicated to helping us remember those who fought there and on every front of World War II. On behalf of the National D-Day Museum and the History Channel, Thank you for watching. Mission, if uh, the CEO don't mind, you buzz the runway and do this. The pilot said, should we let him know we're here? And I said, we better. So he made this mission successful. Then he pulled up, and the damn shackles gave away. All the cases of beer were salvoed over the barracks area. And I stuff went right over our head and hit in the jungle right behind it. Well, we had this Captain Manuel. 
When he come around, he said, if the beers aren't open, you can't drink them. Somebody hauled him back, well, sir, we're opening them so we can drink them. From then on, in all these reunions, there are a couple of guys that, that come up to me and said, well, how's the mad beer bomber of Kermitola doing? And I hate to be called the mad beer bomber <laughs> of Kermitola, but, but that's what happened. We got up into China, and then for about three weeks, we couldn't fly because we didn't have gas. And finally we got our gas, but then we couldn't fly because we didn't have bombs. So after about a week or 10 days, we got our bombs. The um, planes were out warming up that morning, and they called and they said the war was over. Talk about it. To what is now Bangladesh, to a little town called Andal. As far as serving in India is concerned, I looked at it as two fronts. The Japanese was the number one front, but we also fought what I call the five M's. We had the monsoons, and then the mosquitoes, and then the malaria, and then there was the mold and mildew that got on our clothes and was damp all the time. And uh, then there were the monkeys. Now that was another war. The monkeys would come into our barracks and wreak havoc with our mosquito netting, just tear it all to pieces and urinate all over everything. When it wasn't raining, when there was no monsoons, temperature could go to 110, 112. Our wrenches would, would literally be 130, 140 on the uh, airplane wings. It being so hot over there, you can't imagine. You, it, uh, you couldn't wear a shirt or it'd be so hot. And yet if you leaned against anything, you got burnt. And it was pretty miserable, actually, but we did it for a few years. <laughs> we weren't really uh, what you'd call seasoned troops of any kind. We were all civilians. Just came into the service for the war. There's a spirit of camaraderie that you feel. We were so close because we were stuck out in the middle of nowhere. The respect that we have for each other, that's the biggest thing. I haven't met a person who isn't proud of the outfit. It's like, hey, we've survived this far. We're part of the tradition. And we are, we're part of a tradition. Well, first of all, I had no idea where Pearl Harbor was. In those days, uh, you know, there was no TV or anything. I kind of figured it was in Manila in the Philippines. But anyway, when uh, we got home, we told my mother, and I said, well, I'm going to grace to it. The ground crew was extremely important to us. The maintenance crews, the refuelers, the bomb loaders, everyone had the same esprit de corps that the air crews did. I tell you one thing, a loading bomb made you awful fast. Because when you dropped one, even though you know it wasn't gonna go off, you ran. And <laughs> well, we had Indian troops, and they, they were our airplane guards and we were cranking up 1,000-pound bombs. Well, one of these come down. Some way another, the cable broke. Well, we took off, as usual, 
and this Indian guard standing out there, we ran right by him. And that poor guy, he didn't know what he was running from, but he passed us all, rifled, <laughs> big heavy boots and all, but he, it took a while for him to come back after we got back and then started loading again. As a communications guy, we were responsible for setting up telephone lines, we were responsible for fixing radios and sending and receiving messages so that everybody was in communication. We had a little three kilowatt. So I went down to the Navy office and I took a test on the color blindness and I failed it. So at that time, the Navy wouldn't take you. So I went to the Army Air Corps. Boy, they grabbed me real quick and that's where I got started. I, I was a ham radio operator since I was age 15. And since I was a radio operator, I know Morse code. I can send, receive, you know, pretty fast, something like 25 words a minute. And so uh, I figured I, I can be useful. I had always wanted to fly, and they had opened up uh, the cadet training to uh, people without college education. The first time I went, I was a little reluctant <laughs> and turned around and came home. Uh, however, the the second time I went ahead and took the test and qualified for the cadet program. It wasn't so much the fact that I wanted to fly an airplane. I looked forward to the glamorous life that an Air Corps pilot led in a country club. That was the life I wanted, and uh, it looked super good. Join the country club at 21 and live the good life. And if you had to fly airplanes, they'd do it okay. i tell you one thing, a loading bob made you awful fast. Because when you dropped one, even though you know it wasn't going to go off, you ran. And <laughs> well, we had Indian troops, and they, they were our airplane guards and we were cranking up 1,000-pound bombs. Well, one of these come down. Some way another, the cable broke. Well, we took off, as usual, and this Indian guard standing out there, we ran right by him. And that poor guy, he didn't know what he was running from, but he passed us all, rifled, <laughs> big, heavy boots and all. But he, it took a while for him to come back after we got back and then started loading again. As a communications guy, we were responsible for setting up telephone lines. We were responsible for fixing radios and sending and receiving messages so that everybody was in communication. We had a little three kilowatt generator, a little small one, one longer gasoline engine which supplied power for our shack. And it was just limping along. And we knew that the piston rings were going. I wrote a letter to DW Owens and Company and said, can you send me some rings? And about a month later, came a hundred rings. I mean, I didn't need a hundred rings. But, you know, that was the interesting thing. I, if I couldn't get through supply, I wrote directly to the factory. So we went around, around the supply. We went around every path we could to do the job. Well, so the folks were living in Seattle at the time, and my dad was an old German, bullheaded and stubborn. He wouldn't show any emotion if it killed him. Well, my sister, we pulled up there in the house, set up on a Oh, it must have been 25, 30 steps up to it. He was sitting on the porch. And you know, you see these movies, you know, where the kid comes home from overseas and glad to see his son and all that. My dad looked down, he turned and looked at the house and said, hey, Ma, lock the icebox, he's home again. <laughs> that was my greeting. <laughs> As we get older, we try to remember all of the good times that we possibly can, or the times in our life that we had to be proud of ourselves. We were so close, but I can also remember when my time to go home and the attitude, well, if I never see you guys, it'll be too soon, you know, again, you know, but it, it wasn't true. It took about 30 years for our first reunion. I sat down after the first one. I'd never miss another one. And I was going to try my damnness to be the last man. There you go. Thank you. 
Al Mattel, the gunner. In the morning, we had a cabin. And I played hearts and pinochle for two or three days. I got so bored I couldn't stand myself. This would have been uh, right after the hurricane came up through. And we had a large convoy, but you'd never know it because of the waves. I could stand on the deck, could not see another ship around when we were in the swell. When we get up on top, I could see 98 ships. It took two months during May, June, July of 42, which was the worst sinkings of all Allied ships during World War II. And we zigged and zagged across the ocean. We had a number of submarine scares where we all had to put on a life jacket and come up on deck. And finally, we made it to Karachi, India. I finally made it to Karachi, and the 490th was just in the very beginning stages of organization. We were out digging trenches out in the field, no airplane yet. And all of a sudden, one day, we looked up, and here come nine B-25 flying over. And that was the first of the squadron that we'd seen. And that's... And sometimes a, t a tail gunner. It was very, very close quarters. And when I think back today about the things that the navigator had to go through, I just can't imagine how he did any of his navigator, because he had such a small area to work in. You know, they had big charts, and they were trying to look out of the window in their the, or sextants or whatever. In the top turret, the controls were down here. And I had to pull it back, I lift the guns up, I lower the gun, turn it to the right, turn it to the left. And my sights are right between the guns, and the guns is on each side of me. And, of course, there's a plastic dome over me. And that's where I sat. It was one of them with a solid nose that had cannon in it. And poor navigator, he had to load that time thing and get out of the way when the pilot <laughs> fired it because it would have had quite a recoil. People would swear the airplane stopped uh, in mid-flight. The only time that I flew was on test hop. If we had an engine change or some major uh, problem, after an engine change, someone in the crew always had to fly, just to prove to the pilot that we did a good job. And I loved that. We talk about our families, and we talk about the war, and we refresh our memories with one another. I guess that's it. And we win the war every time we're there, too. Oh, yeah. We, we make sure it stays won. <laughs> It's one place where we can talk about experiences and, and not feel like we're bragging or anything like that. And of course, some of the stories, I think, as the years go on, get embellished a little bit. <laughs> the nice part about it is that we're getting a second generation involved in the people that are our host here in Salt Lake City. Their father was in the unit with us. The children of these people, especially those who were lost uh, during the war, will come to the reunions to learn a little bit about what happened to their dad or a little bit about them. I'm very pleased that my sons have taken an interest in coming because uh, it sort of shows that, that they've got an interest of what their dad did overseas. You can see in his face, in, in the way he acts, even the way he walks, he acts younger, he acts more vibrant. Uh, his voice is stronger. It's really interesting, and I've seen that with the other guys, too. Probably one of the most moving sessions of these get-togethers is when soldiers were uh, killed. I think Japan and the United States now are allies. I think that I think our scars are healed, that we don't look upon them anymore as uh, enemies. Uh, especially as we get older, you know, it, it fades the hatred and animosity fades. 
I think all our, our, our overhead wires were bare, weren't they? Yeah, well, that was put up by the British. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I remember there was a, a monkey that was in that. One of the yeah. fellows had a pet monkey. That's how we got the monkey. Oh, well, that, he went up there. Yeah, well, he got caught a shock, fell yeah. down. And my roommate yeah. went out there to give him artificial Yes, yeah, that's right. Now, he was killed, wasn't he? No, what happened was we took the monkey out in the Jeep, went way the heck out, and turned him loose. At first, he followed us back. Then he climbed up a tree, and they had the saddest look on his face. <laughs> if you can say a monkey had a sad look on his face. Yeah. Working at Kermitola on a plane and a jeep pulled up, Red Cross girl, and she hollers, soldier's coffee. I don't drink coffee, but, you know, she was a pretty girl. So she says, sugar, and I said, I'll take sugar. She was running behind in the Jeep and got a dip of sugar out of the big kettle. And she turned around, and she hit her elbow and spilled the sugar all down the front. And she looked up with a cute smile. And she said, just like sugar on the door. The experience of every generation is yours. On the History Channel, where the past comes alive. What you're about to see is a chapter of World War II that is relatively unknown. We must remember that World War II was truly a world war, with combat stretching into the most remote and forbidding corners of the globe. You're about to hear stories from what some think of as the Forgotten War, the conflict in the China-Burma-India theater, or the CBI, a region with resources that Japan needed to wage war. Japan's advance had to be stopped, and that meant severing the Japanese supply lines, in particular the bridges. Charged with cutting those supply lines, the U.S. Army Air Corps, 490th, otherwise known as the Skull and Wing Squadron. Like all American forces, the 490th faced many challenges. Nothing was easy. And because so much time and money had to be focused on Europe and the Pacific, those in the CBI theater found themselves last in line for everything. Weapons, ammunition, supplies, even food. As a fellow flyer, I'd like to think I have a special understanding.